great pleasure to welcome you all to this inaugural uh, event of the Neighborhood Environmental Education Project by GTEC, the Green Technology Education Center. It's the first in a series of such events, and you can find out about that. Uh, there's a handout on the table that will list the whole series. And of course, it's also on our website at gtechcanada.ca. It's a great pleasure to have Sarah Fralin from the uh, Fraser Basin Council Emotive Program. Is, it, is Emotive one of the programs that you work with, or is it your central program? I'm not quite sure. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So Emotive is a program that I spend about 80% of my time on, and then the Fraser Basin Council um, spends a lot of time doing diverse work um, in the areas of climate change adaptation planning. So we do a lot of like flood and fire mitigation planning with um, different municipalities throughout BC. Um, we work a lot um, with adaptation professionals, and then we also provide a lot of facilitation services, um, bringing together governments, First Nations, and the business sector. So it's a diverse organization. <laughs> Before we begin, also, I should just take one moment and give thanks to uh, Kitsilano Neighborhood House, who's our partner and has provided the space for these events uh, pro bono, free of charge, uh, mm -hmm. to GTEC and also to the Vancouver Foundation who has uh, supported uh, these events. So with that, over to Sarah. Thank you so much. So I do just want to take a moment to thank Arden for um, inviting me to come and speak. We've been talking about GTEC and, and um, different types of speakers that we could bring into this space uh, for like a year or more now. And so it's really exciting to, to see it come to life. So real big congratulations to you and your board for all the hard work that you've done to bring this together. I think it's really exciting. Thank you. Um, so as Arden said, my name is Sarah and I work for the Fraser Basin Council. And and today I'm here to talk to you all about electric vehicles. Uh, so primarily we do our electric vehicle outreach and engagement under a program called Emotive. And Emotive is a provincial government campaign that the Fraser Basin Council is carrying out on their behalf. So can everybody see these slides? If I get in your way, just give me a wave and I'll kind of step back every so often. But today what we're going to go through is I'll introduce you to the Emotive Campaign. Um, I'll talk to you about the frequently asked questions that we hear when we're engaging with the public around electric vehicles. Um, we'll talk about some of the EV advantages, the incentive programs in British Columbia if you are looking to purchase an electric vehicle or, in charge, or install charging infrastructure. And then we'll end with like how you can join us if you're interested in getting more involved. Uh, throughout the presentation, please feel free to ask me questions. I do want this to be a little more interactive and engaging, and, and I'm happy to just stand up here and talk for half an hour, but it's much more interesting if you know you pipe in and you ask me something interesting throughout the presentation. Um, so Emotive is a collaboration. Um, we operate throughout the province of BC. We work with a number of different partners, including um, governments, um, as well as the private sector and nonprofit and charities. Um, our mission is to increase the awareness around electric vehicles uh, in British Columbia. We are brand neutral, so we don't advocate for any specific vehicle make or model or charging infrastructure make or model. Um, we try to kind of step, take a step back and talk about kind of how fun it is to own an electric vehicle, um, help people understand what the differences are, help people become more comfortable talking about electric vehicles, and hopefully going to a dealership or looking online for a used vehicle and eventually making that transition in their own lives. So the Emotive Campaign primarily does public events. Similar to this one, although this presentation isn't given that often, mostly you can find us at farmers markets and music festivals and home shows and um, other opportunities to engage in the public where we'll do a table and we'll often offer test drives. So we bring vehicles and we let you take them out for a ride. The other thing that we do as a primary piece of engagement is we work with over 200 EV owners throughout BC and we have them come to our event 
events with their vehicles so you can talk to them about what it's like to own an EV. We find that sharing those stories of personal ownership and providing an opportunity for the public to really ask questions from an EV owner is one of the best ways to get over a lot of the stigmas or myths around EV ownership. Um, so there um, used to be a lot of research done in Canada around perceptions of EVs. Unfortunately, um, funding for that dried up in the last few years. <laughs> but based on that research that was done, um, awareness of EVs or electric vehicles in Canada was very low. And that really spurred the kind of creation of Emotive, which was not originally created by the province, but created through a consortium um, of uh, public, private um, sector players, as well as uh, different levels of government. Um, the research also said that vehicle purchases are done from a very emotional place, that uh, people's vehicles are a very personal thing. Um, it connects to feelings, to style, to status, to image, to perceptions. And so one of the things we try to do in Emotive is highlight how fun it is to own an EV and how easy it is to own an EV. And we kind of guide you through that process. Um, so as I said before, uh, we work with 200 volunteers throughout the province. These are the current owners um, that uh, the slide's referring to that really are our best messengers. However, the conversation is changing, which is a great thing. Uh, we are seeing more and more people are aware of what an electric vehicle is, more and more people are aware of the charging infrastructure, of the opportunities, of the diversity in vehicles available on the market today. So that's been really exciting. Uh, more people are interested in getting them. EV sales have been growing in Canada, and I'll show you some stats a little bit later. And um, current owners have increasingly had more positive experiences owning an EV. Uh, you may remember some of the very first electric vehicles that entered the market, such as the Nissan Leaf, had a very low range, and range anxiety was a really big issue for a lot of EV owners and people considering becoming an EV owner. Since that time, luckily, battery technology has evolved quite a bit. Ranges are a lot higher, and so we're able to overcome that range anxiety, both with um, increased battery capacity, but also the addition of public charging infrastructure, which we'll look at a little bit later, too. So the key messages in Emotive, again, are how exciting and innovative and convenient, affordable, clean um, it is to, to own an electric vehicle. Um, and so these are just some of our campaign partners and we are always looking for more. So if you are a part of an organization or you're an individual who's just really passionate, you are welcome to join us. And we all operate under the one banner of a motive to try and create some sort of brand continuity in the public eye. Um, the idea is that if every municipality and every business was just doing EV promotion on their own, it leads to a lot of confusion in the public sphere, uh, mostly because there are, are there's such diversity in the technologies available right now. But if we all operate under a motive and we're kind of educating around the idea of electric vehicles, we find that the message comes across a lot clearer. So in, uh, I've been doing this role for two years now. And so uh, in a motive, we do, um, we do, between 100 and 150 events throughout the province every year um, with all of our partners. So through that time, we've come um, up with a number of frequently asked questions that we often get from the public. Um, and there's a real spectrum there of knowledge from I know nothing to I think I'm an expert and let me tell you what I know, right? Which is great, you know? I'm so happy to engage with people who you know, are, are well-read in the area and probably know more than me because the technology is changing so quickly. But on one side of the spectrum, we get questions like, what is an electric vehicle? And what is the difference between an electric vehicle and a hybrid, or a plug-in hybrid, or a fuel cell vehicle, right? And, um, and that's a very valid question, because it's very jargony, right? EV is jargon on its own, right? So um, for Emotive, um, and operating under the provincial government's guidance, we don't consider conventional hybrid vehicles an electric vehicle. And we don't do that because you cannot charge them using electricity. You can only generate electricity on board using gasoline from the gas station. 
Whereas the other three models are, well, the plug-in hybrid in comparison gets its electricity from plugging into a hole in the wall, just like this one here. <laughs> it also has a gas engine on board to provide extended or additional range. And so you do need to fill up that gas tank as well, but the gas tank is not creating onboard power. So that's the big difference between the conventional and the plug-in hybrids. Um, an all battery electric vehicle does not have a gas tank, does not use fuel at all. It plugs into the wall and charges the battery on board and all of your motion comes from that charge. Fuel cell vehicles are really new to the market and something we've only started to um, promote in the last year and those run off of hydrogen and emit water vapor as an emission. Um, they are still kind of scarce. I believe there's only two vehicle models available um, for sale in British Columbia and there are only two fueling stations in the lower mainland. Um, but that Fuel cell vehicles is one that we're watching because it does give us quite a bit of additional range. Um, and that is particularly important when you are moving up in size of vehicles, specifically getting into industrial commercial vehicles like larger trucks. So here in British Columbia, um, at the moment we have over 45 electric vehicles that are available for incentive programs in BC. Now there are other vehicles that you can buy, but under a motive, we only really talk about vehicles that are eligible for the incentive programs. So this flyer that I have up here is on the table at the back. You are welcome to take one home. On the flyer, it'll tell you what the MSRP, so what is the price of the vehicle, what is the range of the vehicle, so how far can you drive on a charge. Um, and then on the very, uh, which not in this photo, but on the poster on the bottom are the different incentive programs. And I will come back to those in detail. Sarah, yes. I'm looking at the range of vehicles available. My question, having searched for an electric vehicle, mm -hmm. I guess it was two years ago, how available are they actually? So that is a great question. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, dealerships in British Columbia have been a little bit slow to ensure that the electric vehicles that they have for sale in other parts of the world are available for sale in BC. So it's really about stock. Is, that, is the car on the lot? Can you buy it today? Um, and the answer is sometimes. <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, so the provincial government did uh, pass new um, supply management legislation this year that is supposed to address that problem. Um, and so we're kind of watching to wait and see how that goes. Um, we have been in communication with dealerships to highlight this barrier to EV purchases. Um, specifically, if people are going to dealerships looking to test drive or look at different vehicles, like they're shopping around and they can't actually look at or see that vehicle. So in response to that, we've been working with our EV owners to put on public test drives. Our biggest event is ElectraFest, which happens in August at the Roundhouse Community Center. Um, and we, I think this year we had like, around 20 different vehicles that you could test drive on site and we had another 10 just on display that you could look at and sit in and take a selfie or push the buttons um, to get a feel for it um, and we really do that in response to the lack of vehicles on dealership lots again we are hoping that will change Thank you for the question. <laughs> um, so passenger vehicles are evolving quickly. Um, pickup trucks are kind of what everybody is most looking forward to. That's going to be the next big influx of vehicles coming. This is the um, Rivian that is slated to come out in 2020. So there's lots to look forward to. Uh, passenger vehicles are not the only uh, type of vehicles available. There are a lot of what we call special use vehicles, things like school buses, chairlifts, Zambonis, um, and, and many others um, are also entering the electric vehicle market. And there is a special incentive program um, for these types of vehicles as well. So the other major question that we get um, from the public is, 
how do I charge my EV? Um, and the simplest answer is you charge at home with a regular plug, just like this. So we call that a level one charger. So it's 120 volts, just like any plug in your house. And every electric vehicle comes with a plug that you can plug in at home, just like that. However, it's a bit of a slow charge, what we call a trickle charge. is not that much power being sent to your vehicle, so it takes longer to get a full charge of your battery. There are other charging methods. There's the level two charger, which works off of a 240 volt, which is the same plug that you might see um, behind your stove or behind your dryer, right? Some garages have this. New buildings have it. Thank you to the city of Vancouver building bylaw, but not every new building if you're outside of the city. Um, so that uh, will cut your charge time in half. And then uh, we have a plethora of options in the DC fast charger realm and these are much more expensive and you usually only see them as public infrastructure. Um, BC Hydro and Tesla are uh, some of the people that are building these out the quickest. And I saw a hand there. Yeah, so for charge times, approximately what are you looking at? So charge times vary because your batteries in vehicles vary greatly. If your battery only gives you 100 kilometers of range, you can charge that baby really fast. But if you've got a five or 600 kilometer range battery, it's gonna take a lot more time. Does that kind of answer your question? So, mm -hmm. so if, mm -hmm. if I have a 500 kilometer car, it could charge for eight hours overnight or something? Yep, even more. I would say like if you have a Tesla Model X with the maximum range, which I think is like 550 or just under 600 kilometers, it could take you 12 to 14 hours on a level one charger to charge that overnight. I would say most people that do own a larger range Tesla would opt to install a level two charger to cut that in half. I was just going to ask that, what's involved yeah. in installing a level two, like say you own your own house and you want to install it? Yeah. Um, so, uh, one, you need to have the right electrical hookup, so you need to have that 240 volt connection. So that can be expensive to install if you don't have that. For example, if you're thinking like, oh, I want to install this in my garage, but my garage only has 120 power hookup, it means you're going to have to hire an electrician to come in, dig a new line, and put a new line into your garage. So it can be pricey. If you already have that base, like the 240 volt hookup, and you're just going to buy a little charging machine to put on it, that can be as low $500 to $1,000. It doesn't have to be a lot. The real expense is getting the power connection. And roughly, how much is that? Uh, that I cannot even begin to go down. It depends on the layout, how far you're going, what is in your soil, how many other things are in the way, if you have to bore through concrete. Um, so it really depends. Yeah. So does, mm -hmm. does the government incentive program cover any of those costs or is it just applied to the vehicle? There are. There's a brand new incentive program that was just launched this week and I will come back to that because I have a slide for it. Um, so one of the other questions that we often get in, from the public sphere is how do I find charging stations? Um, so as many as 30% of EV owners are considered garage orphans, which means they are unable to charge at home. They don't have a garage, they live in a multi-unit residential building that doesn't have any power in the parkade or whatever other reason, but they just they don't have that capability. So they rely exclusively on public infrastructure. Um, so there are a number of ways of finding the public infrastructure. Um, um, there are websites and apps affiliated with each of these, so PlugShare, ChargeHub, BC Hydro, and as of late, Google Maps um, now all has the charging infrastructure listed. This image here is a screenshot from PlugShare. It's probably the most comprehensive one-stop shop to get your information. And to just give you an example of the types of information you'll find out, if we look at this, um, so we're just looking at this station, the Arbutus charging station there, and you can see um, this tells you the plug, this tells you the network that it's on, the address, phone number, how much it costs, right? Uh, and what's nearby, when it's open, um, all sorts of details. There's also a whole chat and help section. If you um, arrive and you're like, I don't know what to do, you can like type in, help me. Someone will chat with you right away and help guide you through the process. 
So um, a lot of people wonder if EVs are really the future of the transportation sector. And um, all I can really say is that sales of EVs have been rising not only globally, but also here in Canada. And what you can see is actually in Canada, the growth rate is significantly higher than the rest of the world. So we're actually really at the forefront here in Canada in terms of electric vehicle adoption. Um, a lot of people are choosing to make that transition here, um, and we call those early adopters. I can leave that up. <laughs> Sorry, yep. What was the growth rate in Canada again? What was that? About 46 percent from the 2017 to 2018. Yeah, that's the globe. Yeah, globally, and then in Canada, it's much bigger. Yeah. Why is That's a great question. I don't think there has been too much research done comparing Canada to other places in terms of why our adoption is high. Um, my, from literature that comes out of the states where there's a lot more research actually done there, there are a couple really um, key contributing factors. One is government incentives to offset the cost of ownership. One is investment in public charging infrastructure. Um, and the third is availability. So I think Canada has done a pretty good job around creating um, the um, incentive, pro multiple incentive programs. We've got federal. Provincial. Well, we have federal and provincial now. Federal, okay. Yep, there's oh, both. That's right. yeah. Yep, um, and then the public infrastructure has really only seen a big build out, I would say, in the last three years. Um, and I think that actually kind of correlates well to where you see that growth rate coming in, because when the infrastructure was there, I think that was a big barrier. This is my opinion. I think that was a big barrier for a lot of people, was where do I charge? Um, and as soon as that infrastructure was visible and people could see it being built, I think that changed a lot of minds. Yeah. Sarah, I know mm -hmm. someone told me Petrocan has now yep. suggested that they're going to quit. Already started. Yeah. Yeah, Petrocan is doing a, uh, they're calling it the coast to coast electric connector or something like that. They've got some like pretty savvy branding around it, but they are building um, fast chargers um, across Highway Type 1. Three. Yep. Uh, primarily along Highway 1 to connect. So the Type 3 mm -hmm. um, charger, 20 minutes, half an hour, are you going to be? You'll get 80%. So that first 80% of a charge you get really fast. It's kind of similar to your cell phone. And then the last 20%, the charge rate slows right down. So to get to 80%, 20 minutes, half an hour, no problem. To get that remaining 20% might take another 20 minutes or half an hour, though. So the okay. same amount of time. So you stop and you have lunch? Or? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so here's just another um, uh, graph of sales of electric of, of plug-in electric vehicles in Canada. So um, I apologize, we don't have any statistics for 2019 yet. Um, hopefully, this will come out soon, and then I can update this slide. But um, in 2018, we surpassed two million electric vehicles um, on the road in Canada. So that was um, an exciting milestone here. Help me with this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I researched electric vehicles, and it was actually, I confess, five years ago now, but one of the things that fascinated me is there's a huge percentage of the trips that we do uh, that are never over 40 kilometers. So the whole thing about range anxiety is sort of applies to a very narrow range of the actual automobile use. Mm -hmm. do, do you have a grip on that? Is it... I think, I mean, range anxiety is a very emotional thing, and a lot of it is not actually connected to, to reality. And, and I think what's important when talking to someone around range is to recognize that this is a fear on an emotional level, and the only way to get over that is to help them understand all of the options of where they can charge when they're out and about. So really to provide them with those charging opportunities. Um, other than that, I think um, the, the other way to overcome range anxiety is to get in your EV and own it and drive it every day and then you learn how far you actually drive. But that's a hard sell, so we focus on what are the opportunities for charging when you're out and about. Yeah, that's right. 
Great, so there are a lot of advantages of driving an electric vehicle that we highlight to the public. Uh, one of them is its great performance. So if you um, are unaware, EVs um, have a direct um, connection between their ability to accelerate and our ability to draw power from the battery. So you actually can accelerate much quicker in an electric vehicle than you can in a gas engine. Uh, and so this is a photo from uh, a Tesla YouTube reviewer who took out his partner um, in the ludicrous mode for the first time and that's her facial reaction as he steps on the gas and accelerates. <laughs> Little slip there, stepped on the gas. Ste <laughs> did, right, stepped on the accelerator. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so one of the other benefits of owning an electric vehicle is your ability to reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that you produce through the use of your vehicle. Um, and what we can see here is that in Canada, whether you are charging your vehicle in British Columbia, which operates on hydroelectricity, or you're charging in Alberta, which operates primarily um, electricity is produced primarily from coal power plants still. In both cases, you are significantly lowering your greenhouse gas emissions. So although in BC we can tout our clean um, electricity grid, not every province in Canada has that benefit. But what we like to highlight is that because electric vehicles are so much more efficient, regardless of where your electricity is coming from, you are going to save on your emissions. So one of the other big advantages of owning an electric vehicle is the stark difference in the amount of moving parts compared to a conventional combustion engine vehicle. So um, electric cars, because they don't have um, an engine on board, they're not a mobile power plant producing the electricity <laughs> as you drive around. We get rid of all of those parts and you don't need to maintain any of them. So the maintenance on electric vehicles is significantly less. Um, a couple of the things that you do have to monitor is your tire pressure, which you should be monitoring in your vehicle anyways. Tire pressure has a huge impact on the efficiency of your vehicle on the road, um, as well as your windshield wiper solution, because that can get low as well. So um, not only do we save on greenhouse gas emissions, but you also save on fuel costs. <laughs> so um, this graph is um, a comparison of similar vehicles. So we're not really comparing oranges and oranges, but we've got the Nissan Versa and the Nissan Leaf, the Chevrolet Cruze and the Chevrolet Bolt, the BMW 3 and the BMW i3. And you can see here, these are your annual fuel costs, um, how much you would save um, by transitioning away from gasoline to electricity as your fuel source. Great, so now um, I'll spend a little bit of time just talking about the different um, incentive programs. So if you are looking for a vehicle, um, this is probably what you're most interested in, which is great. So um, at the moment, there are three incentive programs that you can combine here in British Columbia when purchasing a passenger vehicle. And that's the CEV for BC program. So you can get up to $5,000 there. There is the Scrap It program where you have to bring a used combustion engine vehicle to to scrap it for them to recycle and in exchange they'll give you up to six thousand dollars and then there's the brand new federal incentive program over here ISEV which can also give you an additional five thousand so you can stack these programs in British Columbia to take advantage of all three the other program is a special use vehicle program. So we looked at that slide that had forklifts and Zambonis and school buses. Um, if you're a business that is looking to transition your fleet, that would be the program that's probably of most interest to you. Um, that program <laughs> has every vehicle has a specific earmarked incentive amount and you can go on they have a website and you can download their um, their kind of like vehicle sheet we've got over 200 vehicles on the list so I can't go through all them with you now but to give you an example um, a school bus would have an incentive of about fifty thousand dollars attached to it So brand new announced this week is the BC provincial government's um, new incentives uh, for charging infrastructure. It's called Go Electric EV Charger Rebate Program. 
You can find out more about this on the new Clean BC website, also launched this week. Basically, you get up to 50% off the purchase installation costs, up to, in a home, it's 350, but right now it's 700 because BC Hydro is matching it, but they haven't said how long they will match it for. In condos and apartments, so multi-unit residential buildings, up to 14,000 or 2,000 per station. They're thinking that um, in a multi-residential building, you're gonna want multiple multiple stations in your parkade. And then in workplaces, um, it's the same, but you must get pre-approval. So that was just launched this week. Um, so if you are thinking of installing a charging station, I would encourage you to take advantage. We have had um, multiple other charging infrastructure incentive programs in the past in BC. So we had the Charging Solutions Incentive Program and the Zap BC program, uh, and both of them ran out of funds. They're so popular that they went really fast. So if you are looking, I would encourage you <laughs> to make a decision quickly. <laughs> uh, the other big benefit of owning an electric vehicle in British Columbia is that you get an HOV sticker. Um, so even if you are one person in your electric vehicle, with this sticker, you can drive in the HOV lane. So you do get that kind of pref preferential treatment on the highways. Um, and here in British Columbia, our government has made um, some uh, made new policies this year around zero, zero emission vehicle targets. So by um, 2025, uh, they want so 10% uh, of all vehicle sales in BC must be. Um, plug-in hybrids or all battery electric. By 2030 it's 30 and by 2040 it's 100 percent. So there are some pretty um, aggressive sales targets there so it'll be really interesting to see um, how that carries out over the next few years. Great, so I'm just going to end with how you can join Emotive if you are interested in getting more involved. Um, so uh, if you are an EV owner, I would encourage you to become an EV ambassador. Uh, what does that mean? It means you'll be invited to all of our public events to bring your vehicle and to talk about your experience as an EV owner. Um, there's no minimum commitment. You can not come to any events this year and go to 100 events next year, and that's fine. Um, we recognize that everybody has a, a busy schedule, and um, that's why we are constantly recruiting new um, ambassadors into our program um, so that we can continually have new vehicles available for people to see and ask questions about at all of our events. Join us, yay. Okay, you can also engage with us online. So uh, we have an emotive website that uh, talks about the events that we do and um, connects you to other resources. Um, we have an active social media accounts on Facebook and Instagram. Um, we're happy to answer your questions online. Um, and then we also host the Plugin BC website. The Plugin BC website is your best one-stop shop to find out about incentive programs, for vehicle ownership and for charging infrastructure. Um, it connects you back to government policies. We've got uh, various funding programs if you want to bring events to your workplace or your community um, and ways that um, uh, you can volunteer with us as well as access to all of the materials that you see on this table are available digitally on our website. We also have this Ask an EV Expert feature where you can chat with um, another staff person in our office who's really an EV expert. So if you've got some you know, technical question or, or something that you know, uh, me or any of my volunteers are not able to answer or you just can't find it online, you can quickly type that in and our EV expert will get back to you really quickly. So joining Emotive can look like uh, joining our campaigns network. So that's our network of all our pa partners throughout British Columbia. We meet online every few months to talk about um, events and outreach tactics and barriers and kind of how everybody's doing in the EV engagement world. Uh, you can volunteer with us by becoming an electric vehicle advisor. You can request event materials if you want to give a presentation like this at your workplace or in your strata building or uh, just in your family living room, right? We can provide you with handouts, with a slide deck, um, what we call event kits to help foster um, you communicating that message. Um, 
and then you can apply for funding. So if you are like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited about this, I want to bring this to my farmer's market and do a test drive, we have money to help you do that. So you can apply for an outreach incentive um, funding program and uh, receive up to $30,000 to do EV outreach um, in your community. So all of my contact information is here. <laughs> you are welcome to reach out to me with any of your questions about this presentation, about EVs in general, or about how to get more involved. Um, we do a lot of events throughout the year. We're at the Vancouver Auto Show every year. Um, we run ElectraFest at the Roundhouse Community Center in August. That's the biggest um, EV event in Canada. Um, and we do about 100 other events throughout the province, throughout mostly the summer months. Um, but we would love love to have you involved and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have for the remaining 20 minutes or so that we have tonight. Um, there's a bunch of handouts on the table there. There's um, flyers for the CEV program, the Scrap It program, the SUV program, so those are all the incentive programs. We also have a newsletter that we send out every month that will tell you what new vehicles are available, what changes there are in the incentive programs, um, what upcoming events are happening. Thank you so much for coming here today. I really appreciate engaging with you all here in this beautiful space. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Who else is installing uh, these public uh, charging stations? You mentioned like Petrocan getting in. Yeah, it. so it's an open market. So there are a lot of private players in it. Um, I would say there's about 10 off the top of my head that I could list. Um, but in terms of the large fast chargers, BC Hydro, Fortis, and Tesla are the big players in that world. Petrocan has just joined them. So it'll be interesting to watch and see how Petrocan enters that market. Are, are nonprofits getting into it or is that something that would not? Not that I know of. It totally is feasible. I don't know if they have the capacity to do so. I haven't heard of any. Um, any nonprofits. Uh, the Accelerate Kootenays works with um, Sun Country, and they have been collaborating to install Sun Country chargers. Um, but I don't know the details around that collaboration in terms of cost sharing. Yeah. To your knowledge, uh, like uh, how this, how long does on average like this battery? So most electric vehicles will come with a battery warranty of 8 to 10 years. That doesn't mean that your battery is going to not work after 10 years, but you are definitely going to see some degre degradation in the battery, so it won't be able to hold as much charge as it used to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just to your knowledge, you know, let's say it's the most popular kind of vehicle now, a similar models from same manufacturer, what's the price difference now for the conventional, you know, like engine economy, go to this EV vehicle? Um, so as you can see from our EV handout, the actual price variation is huge. So you can get vehicles as low as, you know, $35,000 and as high as $200,000. So it really depends on the type of vehicle you're looking for. Yeah, there's a lot of luxury models, but there are a lot of base models as well. And also, the, the, in, in the buying decision, people need to be aware of the incentives because they can reduce their costs exactly substantially. Yeah, um, up to ten. So yeah, you can get five, six, and three. Is that right? Nice. So fourteen thousand. Fourteen months. Yeah. 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 Great. What do we know about weather, the impact of weather coming from Saskatchewan? I know there's, there was reticence in minus 40 degree weather, the impact on batteries, and I don't know that. Yeah, so extreme hot cold. and extreme cold do impact battery range. Extreme cold is usually defined as colder than minus 10, and extreme hot would be hotter than about 40 degrees. Celsius here in Canada. <laughs> um, so yeah, in Saskatchewan, in Alberta, in northern BC, that is a major concern. Um, there increasingly have been more um, ownership in those areas, so there are people starting to share their experiences on how they're seeing the battery um, reduce its ability to hold a charge. It hasn't been 
as drastic as some of the online rumors have made it seem. Um, from our experience, we've got, so there's a new electric vehicle club in Prince George. Um, they've got about 20 members, which is great, and none of them have experienced battery degradation due to cold weather in Prince George. So again, that's one small community and a very small demographic and obviously can't be applied everywhere in Canada, but Prince George does get quite cold weather in the winter and quite a bit of snow, um, and we have been hearing positive stories from them. In fact, we're going to be releasing a video around owning an electric vehicle in Prince George, um, hopefully in the early new year, to try to engage people in a conversation around that issue. Is there any research, though, on what the, the degradation factor is? Is it like... 5%, 10, or is it? Um, I can't really speak to that because every vehicle manufacturer would have a different answer on how the cold weather impacts their specific technology. Uh, yeah. well, I, I would say that it's mm. less the degradation, more of a, a, a range reduction because you've got your heater on, you've got all these other devices on. Similarly, in the summer when you have your air conditioning on, it reduces your range. Like, That's a really great point. It's not degradation as much as it's range. And, and I would further add, mm -hmm. when you put snow tires on, it reduces your range versus, say, summer tires. Yep. So those factors, it all comes into play. Mm -hmm. And it is quite minor. One of the ways to offset um, the reduced range in hot and cold is to acclimatize your vehicle while it's plugged in. So to put that air conditioning on while you're still plugged in before you drive out of the garage into the weather. So rather than starting pure cold, it's already warmed up yep. while it's plugged in. Yep, exactly. Cool. That's a good idea. Yeah, and this is coming from an EV owner here, so thank you for sharing, I appreciate that. Can I see anybody else own an EV in the crowd? Just a show of hands. Okay, we've got three, three owners in this crowd, so you can also ask them questions. Can I ask you guys to share with us what electric vehicles you own? Do you want to? Uh, sure, uh, I have Ford Fusion Electric. Ford Fusion. Uh, BMW i3. i3, what do you got? Tesla 3. Fantastic, thank you so much for sharing that information. Uh, I just want to yeah. go back to Bill's question. Um, one of the leading researchers in batteries and, and electric vehicles in the world is Red River College in Winnipeg. So they're starting to produce a lot of very specific data. And they also have a project they've done with, I don't think it's called Winnipeg Flyer anymore, but Winnipeg Flyer, Mitsubishi, government, hydro, and so forth. And they have electric buses running all year round in Winnipeg. So it's fantastic. Um, yeah, and they, they have the data from that. But um, yeah, that's one of their major research areas is um, electric vehicle battery de degradation. And one of the points that um, their team made to me, and they are a partner of GTEx, by the way, at Red River College. One of the points their research team made to me is the same one with uh, that Norman just made, the real problem with the buses was not the degradation of the battery in cold weather. It was keeping people warm in the bus. And you know, it was taking so much juice to mm. do that. They sort of had to reconfigure the uh, system in the buses. Their team did. Right. But, but anyway, it's happening. It's, I think it's in its third year now of, uh, of all year round operation, fully electric buses. Mm -hmm. In Winnipeg. I have one other question. And mm -hmm. You didn't address it, but just curious about ICBC insurance rates on electric vehicles. We there shouldn't be any difference. Same. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Maybe one day have some discount. <laughs> I would encourage you to write to your MP or MLA about that. <laughs> I cannot speak to that. <laughs> Great. I have a question. Yeah. Um, just uh, with regard to um, the, the BC Utility Act, that that that, uh, and and, and uh, I mean, as I understand, mm -hmm. um, aside from the city of Vancouver, for some reason, nobody else can legally charge for electrical usage. But that may be changing. Is that? Uh, so my understanding, and I don't work for the BT Utilities Commission at all, um, is that they made an exemption for charging infrastructure that is no longer considered reselling power if you are only using that power to charge an electric vehicle. 
And that also came out this year. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that's, that, that policy won't change. Because when you go to the US, you have to pay for charging. Yes. For most of the stations. Yeah, and you um, you will start to see paid charging become more popular in the public infrastructure as time goes on. Um, I, I, uh, it's free right now is a bit of an incentive to try to make it easier for people to adopt electric vehicles, but uh, electricity does cost money. Installing those stations and maintaining them does cost money. Uh, some of them already are charging a small fee. Um, uh, Tesla is also charging a small fee on their infrastructure. So I think you will uh, see that become the norm, that you, you will end up paying something. I mean, we're very lucky here in BC. I think we pay with like seven cents a kilowatt hour for power um, in your home at least so charging at home will, will as you may know will have a very small impact on your overall hydro bill um, I think people uh, from the Vancouver Electric Vehicle Association that I've spoken with who do primarily charge at home um, are seeing an increase on their that you pay your hydro every two months I think they're seeing an increase of about $40 on their two monthly bill is it bi-monthly no that's not the right word is it by bi monthly is two months thank you <laughs> on their bi-monthly bill yeah Sir, I want to go back to something uh, that you referred to, um, and it relates to what I, what I call the can loops question. Hmm. I've, I've encountered many people who come to a presentation like this and get excited, go home and think about it, start talking to their partner or family, and then later, it's they, they, what they tell me is, well, when I started to talk to my partner about it, he or she said, well, what about my mother in Kamloops? Hmm. Well, I'll never, we'll never be able to see her again if we get an electric vehicle. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, um, and so they have a question, really. Yeah, and I think, yeah, if you are the kind of person that travels long distances, whether that's for, yeah. you know, camping in the summer or visiting your mother in some other town, and a pure electric vehicle may not be the right vehicle for you because it might not have the battery capacity, the range that you need to get to those places in the time frame that you have, right? The smaller the range, so the shorter the distance you can go, the more often you're gonna have to charge to get to your destination. The alternative is the plug-in hybrid vehicles, right? That do have a longer range. And my related question is, mm -hmm. see, I think what happens often mm -hmm. is that, I mean, that was a great answer, but that's the answer that people need to get and so I've got very interested in the chat room mm. capacity because I think we need to provide continuity to actually provide more adopt to increase the level of adoption mm. so that it isn't as difficult for people yep. you know so you provide an answer there and then if they went on to say okay well what kinds of and that vehicles are available, you could say. I'll be like, let me grab my sheet and show you. Right. <laughs> yeah, we've got all the plug-in hybrids right. are on there. That's right. Yeah. So, um, but they need that second step. Totally. After the, the first introduction at a music festival or here in the neighborhood house or whatever. Yeah. So I'm very interested in the chat room because it sounds like that it, it, it introduces that capacity. Yeah, um, that and, and on social media, we engage in a lot of conversations to that similar um, okay. outcome as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so do let us know, let GTEC know, mm -hmm. how we could help you make sure that people know about. Mm, for sure. Uh, the best thing is to connect them back to the Plug in BC website. So that's this one here, where we have a PDF of this EVs in BC handout. You can download, you can look at it on the new Clean BC website. Uh, which So the provincial government just launched this new website called Clean BC to go with yeah. all their like green infrastructure policies. Um, and they also have a very similar or technical spec sheet as the one we have here. Um, theirs has the added feature where you, if you click on the vehicle, it'll take you to the dealer or the manufacturer's site to learn more about it so whereas ours is just a, um, a static wow. PDF so that's new I could actually show you, do you have internet here do you know no, no. okay I can't show you now but on your cell phones clean BC oh it does say Wi-Fi okay well we could we could we could try it and see and then I can show you guys this would be very exciting let's see 
DC. Bill, it'd be great if we can get that. So <coughs> make sure that we communicate that. Yeah. All right, so they've got this brand new site that just went live on Tuesday, <laughs> yesterday, maybe Monday. Um, You're not projecting it. Oh, and I'm not projecting it. I'm so sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I don't even know. Anybody know how to make this project? Do, do, do. We've got to do like a screen, screen thing, right? Duplicate. Um, maybe. Nope, sorry, not that tech savvy. Sarah, you can, you can send, there me a, send me a link. Oh, there we go, ha, ha, ha. So yeah, so there's a Clean BC website, it's brand new, just went live, it's cleanbc.gov.bc.ca, you can see here, uh, if we go to the clean transportation, blah, 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 let's see if I can find it. Um, it's rebates, maybe it's through here. I haven't spent too much time on the site before, I'm so sorry. Show me the rebates. No, it's down at the bottom here. La la la. Electric cars. Okay, see all. Ta da. So this is brand new. This just went live this week. So you can see these are all the vehicles that are um, eligible for the provincial incentive programs. Um, and you can click on them. So if we go, let me open in a new tab so I don't lose this. Is that going to work? Oh, no, maybe not. Maybe I just have to click. Click. Here we go. So it takes me to the VW site. Where am I buying from? BC. I don't know. Anyway, so you can find out more about the vehicle on the site. So um, on Clean BC, each of the vehicles here has a more info button. Um, and you can click right on it and see. So it is a new site, so I apologize. Um, I'm not super familiar with it, but uh, you're welcome to explore it on your own. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, and the cost sharing stops the using the around this A cost? Oh, car share. So yeah, I believe uh, Moto and Evo both have um, electric vehicles in their fleets. It is not super popular yet. Although I anticipate car shares will adopt EVs quite quickly in the near future. Um, the biggest barrier has been how do you fuel up those vehicles, um, especially I think it's like is the Evo where you can park the vehicle anywhere in the city and just kind of leave it. So it's like how do they, so um, there is a mobile charging truck that BCAA has. So if you are an EV owner, I would uh, recommend an BCAA membership. But um, I'm guessing that that truck will become something replicated that the car share programs will adopt eventually to be able to fuel those vehicles. But it hasn't happened yet. So something to look forward to. <laughs> Do you know how many public charging stations there are in BC? <sighs> Hundreds. Would the majority of the be in Vancouver, Metro Vancouver? Yes, the majority are in the lower mainland. Right. Yeah, and I can show you, we can go to Plug Share right now. So this is great. I love the internet. Plug Share. Yes. So if we go plug share, this is um, one of the, the networks that I spoke to you guys about earlier, right? And close that. Oops. Hi. Do, do, do. Here we go. So here's just like a map of North America. If we zoom into BC, oops, and I think I've got this filtered here. So we're going to go plugs. Oh, oh, we got them all. Okay. Well, it just takes a minute for them to load. <laughs> so as you zoom in, you see more and more dots on the map, but you can see how they're all really concentrated in the lower mainland. There's um, very few going up to Prince George and almost none uh, north of Prince George at this point in time. Great question. So that's plug share. Sorry, what's the difference between the brown and the green? Yep, so I believe orange is the DC fast chargers and the, the green, yeah, so green is level two and orange is the fast charger. So by level two, I mean it's a 240 volt outlet basically and the fast chargers are operating at like 400 plus volts. Zap. Great. Zap? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yep. Any other questions I can answer? 
Cool. Well, I'll stick around for a few minutes. Please check out all the literature on the table there. If you have any questions about that, let me know. And I would encourage you to sign up, sign up for the Plugin BC newsletter if you do want to receive um, updated information. So thank you. Sarah, let me yes. just give a brief sort of overview also of where this fits in the larger picture of what GTEC is up to. So um, our major question for some time as what is the major barrier to further adoption of green technologies such as electric vehicle? And our conclusion and our research shows that um, we're over-reliant, uh, too, 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 too inclined to await governments to uh, enact legislation and regulation that will promote these developments. And that's necessary. But there needs to be also uh, an upsurge in communities throughout North America, throughout the world eventually, that uh, further uh, advances the adoption of green uh, technologies and therefore a reduction in carbon emissions. It's a matter of our future survival as a species at this point. So the work of, uh, of uh, GTEC is to uh, inform, support, and activate communities in becoming uh, more uh, carbon sensitive and adopting green technology at a faster rate. And so what Sarah has shared with us tonight is a very important part of the picture, but there are other parts. And as the series unfolds over the fall, we will be introducing the community and to all of, the, of, of you who are interested, other aspects of the larger picture. Next time, uh, we'll introduce a, one of the many, uh, but this one's a very well-established youth organizations that are engaged in uh, this issue. And uh, we'll also have guests such as Nada, uh, which is a packageless store to introduce um, uh, participants to a package-free, plastic-free world, which is another thing that we have to do. So just to give you the uh, flavor, you can find out uh, anything about this, on, of course, on our website at gtechcanada.ca. And so let me add my thanks to Sarah's for being here tonight with us. Oh, thank you. <laughs>